I'm Phil Hill. And I'm Michael Feldstein. Welcome back to eLiterate TV. In this episode, we're looking at what is courseware and who's providing it. Now, in the mid-2000s, there were really three separate domains. You had platform providers, then you had content providers, and then you had those who did the curricular design and the course design, and they tended to be fairly segmented, separate areas. Now, what's happened recently is there's an overlap between these. So what you might have are new platforms that have the actual content embedded in them. They're really non-separable and they're meant to go, to go together. At the same time, a lot of this content now has learning objectives. And the learning objectives really gets into an area of course design and curricular design. So you have this new area developing that overlaps platforms, content, and curricular design. And it's this area that we're calling courseware. Now, one of the first areas where people are providing solutions are the content providers, primarily the publishers. So they've started developing these courseware offerings for schools. But they're not the only ones. We're already seeing signs of the MOOC providers getting in and licensing their content and essentially offering courseware as, as well. At Educause 2013, we had the opportunity to talk to several people who are involved in creating some of this new courseware to get their perspective. And here's our report. So we're here with David Lindrum of Sumo Publishing and Kim Thanos of Lumen Learning. Um, both are boutique providers of courseware, although as we'll learn, they uh, approach the development of courseware in some different and interesting ways. Uh, David, let's, let's start by talking about what courseware actually is. You have a product called WebTex. And I, when we've talked about before, you've You've referred to it as courses as opposed to books. What, what's the difference? What is it that makes uh, the product a course? It's a great question. Uh, what we do looks a lot like a book and it looks a lot like a course. And so we get the question frequently of what's the difference between a book and a course. A uh, book seems to be, uh, what most people mean by the term book is that it's all the presentational content required to cover the course material. What they mean by a course is a lot more than a book. It's going to include assignments, uh, activities, projects, assessments, uh, everything you'd find in the syllabus, right? Yeah. So most people feel that a book is part of the course, but if your entire course was nothing but start on page one and read to the end of the book, they would say that was a lame course, right? So it's presumed that something will be added. So courseware is software that does a lot of what the book does as well as what you'd expect from the course. Now, Kim, Lumen uh, produces courseware, but you do it in a very different way, right? You're actually facilitating faculty on campuses who are creating courseware products, and then they're released under an open source Creative Commons license. So there are already open textbooks out on the market. What's the difference between something that comes from a company like OpenStax or a project like OpenStax and what comes out of the co collaborative process at Lumen Learning? So, you know, initially when we started thinking about what we were trying to accomplish with the use of open textbooks, we really felt like we really did focus on a, a textbook replacement and uh, went through a process with a group of faculty members with a small set of courses of helping them identify a replacement for the textbook. And it was a great experience and I think a re, a, an excellent proof of concept. But we came out of that, I think, collectively, the, the, pro, the program that was involved in it, feeling like there's a missed opportunity that if we're going to stop and make a fundamental change from a traditional textbook, evaluate new digital materials, whether it's packaged neatly into an open textbook or whether it's a range of resources, that it's a tremendous opportunity to rethink the instructional materials, the instructional process, the learning and engagement opportunities. And so it really created a process, an, an opportunity for redesign. And they're excellent open textbooks. You could take the OpenStax sociology textbook and replace that, use that instead of a commercial textbook that is of equal quality, 
but a significantly different cost to students and a higher level of control for the faculty member. But you really see the benefit of that if the faculty member is looking at the ability to edit, uh, bring in new materials, uh, increase the interaction in the way the students are engaging with the materials. And that's really the process that we're trying to support as we're moving through the transition from traditional textbooks to open resources is really this redesign around interactivity and engagement. Okay. Now redesign is actually a really interesting topic. When you have a product that's a software product, you actually can see how people are interacting with the product. You can see what the students are reading, what videos they're watching, and how they respond to exam questions afterwards. David, how does that change your development? How does that change the next version of your product? It, it changes everything radically, right? So next year will be my 20th year of developing resources, digital resources for use in colleges. But it wasn't until the past six years or so that we've had the analytics to see, did people use it? What did they use? What questions does 98% does of students get right? What questions do 82% of the students get wrong? Um, able to see what they're learning and, and how they're going, right? That enables us to go in and actually do data-driven revision. Right, so we can see what students are understanding and what they're not and then change it, roll it out in the next term and see that now students get it. As an instructional designer, that's, that's life changing. You don't ever want to go back to not knowing what works and what doesn't. And it doesn't, uh, as you were, were saying, it doesn't require you to throw out the whole resource. That doesn't make any sense. What makes more sense is to find the trouble spots and go in and tweak just those, right? Mm -hmm. So that experimentation is, is phenomenal. We, the first version of any course that we create is art. We're bringing all, all of our background, all of our experience to create what we think is the best possible course. The second edition is science. Mm. We have the numbers to drive what we change. Mm. So Kim, you're, you're going through this process that David just described with faculty, who are your authors and teachers. How does this change their view, both of the curricular materials that they're developing and also their teaching process? Well, it's, it's early days. I mean, I think that we have some indicators of some of the changes we're seeing, and uh, what we're seeing now is some common okay. behaviors, and I think over time we're going to have a better sense of which ones really take hold and provide, which, which have staying power. So, you know, there, there are, are many, many faculty members. We, we always provide word-level edit privileges, so you can change anything. You can swap things in and out, and it provides really interesting analytics to say, wow, if, if if a faculty member's revising and seeing significantly better results, what is there there that we could bring back in and share with others to improve those results as well? And so seeing the creativity that faculty members are applying to the open courseware is, is exciting and I think promising, but it's really too early from our work to be able to say this is exactly how that's going to play out. I mean, there are version control issues, there are uh, the addition kind of challenges of how frequently do faculty members really want to see these kinds of enhancements coming into their courses and how much of that can they absorb. So a lot of questions still to answer. But I think we're seeing a path around that that's very promising. So I hear a lot from both of you about experimentation, about what we're learning. And this is very different than with a textbook. With a textbook, we have a formula. Textbooks look pretty much the same year to year to year and have for a while. With courseware, it, does, it seems to me there isn't so much of a formula. We're still learning and we're bringing new skills to bear. The, the skill to write a good chapter in a textbook is not necessarily the, sk the same skill you need to write the test questions and tune those two to each other. Now, Kim, your process is very faculty centric from the beginning. How do you bring in those other team members to the conversation and, and how, how do the faculty respond to that new dynamic in the authoring environment? Well, we've tried to keep a process that is that matches more of an agile software development process, which is frequent iterative cycles of improvement. And so there is a first cycle that we go through that is laying out a very broad set of open materials to a cross-institutional faculty team. So where we have found, where we've run into problems with the engagement of our faculty teams is if, if there's a single faculty member who is the primary kind of developer or the primary uh, subject matter expert, there's an open dynamic around adoption that is, if it is your work and you give it to me, I want to give you back my work, which is even better. Mm -hmm. But if we team together, 
and we create something and then we bring David in, then he will say, oh, and we could also contribute this. Mm -hmm. So multiple players is key. Multiple institutions is really important to us as well. And then we start to use it. Mm -hmm. And most of our iteration occurs from watching best practices in use and sharing those back more broadly, mm -hmm. or identifying soft spots and investing to enhance and improve in those areas that are soft. Mm -hmm. And then looking for opportunities to have increased examples of engagement or opportunities for engagement that we can connect together across the community of users or share across the community of users mm -hmm. so that they have a chance to learn from each other's successes and experiences or connect into interesting things that are happening at other institutions in that learning process within the course. David, when you're working with faculty with your products um, and you have been on this path from art to craft, to hopefully in some cases science. What is it that you want to say to adopting faculty about the partnership that you want to develop with them? What do you have that you want to offer to them and what are you hoping that they'll bring back to the table? So what they have that we can't possibly have is a deep understanding of their own students and their own institution. And it's surprisingly hard to get them to tell me yeah. about the unique characteristics of their institution. Like we always use discussion boards or we never use discussion boards. We write in every class. We don't do papers. You know, I need to know those things. They don't know that I need to know them. They think everything we present to them is take it or leave it. They don't understand the degree to which we are eager to shape it for their particular students. Uh, textbooks, uh, published textbooks tend to be a superset of what anyone will teach. That's quite intentional so that it's useful to many people. Uh, we don't want to include chapters they're not going to teach. Students are confused um, by optional materials. It tends to add noise to the system. So we really want to tailor it. And typically we do tailor every course for every school to a certain degree. So it's getting them to engage in that discussion that's the hard part. Well, thank you both for a fantastic discussion and for joining us on eLiterate TV. So what did we learn, Phil? Well, one thing that really struck me that we heard from both of them is the fact that this is not just a digital textbook with more materials. I think a lot of people tend to think of the new developments in digital content is how do we take the textbook and make it digital? And then now how do we throw extra tools on top of it? But a theme that I heard throughout the discussions is they were talking about team-based course design. How do we involve faculty? How do we involve this group? And it's almost as if courseware gives an opportunity to implement team-based course design. A lot of the individual elements are what we've already known about, but how do you get a package together? And so this sort of represents a paradigm shift, if you will. And so the second thing that really struck me as a fact is they referred to this is still in its infancy. We're trying to find out, we don't quite know where all this will go. We're seeing promising results, but it's early on. And if you think about it in terms of this being a paradigm shift, not just a new technology implementation, it indicates to me we're talking about a long-term strategic change, if you will. So people need to think about where is courseware going over a term of five to seven years, as opposed to what's gonna happen in the next year or two. So those were two things that really struck me from the conversations. Absolutely, long journey. But any journey starts with a single step, as the saying goes. So as you think about your journey and where you're going to start, we'd like to hear from you. Where do you think on your campus you need to begin conversation about courseware? What are the issues and what are the opportunities? Let us know.